what is go to market really? That is the million dollar question, right? I'm probably gonna make some people unhappy with this answer, but I'm gonna be honest. I am not a huge fan of intent-based triggers, and here's why. So like four months ago, Kristen, how would you approach it versus today? A few months ago, everything was about growth at all costs, and now it's just like all about doing more with less. A value prop should be simply one sentence on what you do better than anybody else. Understand what others have done before me, I'm gonna search online, and so making sure I map that buyer journey to say what are all those considerations that a buyer would typically go through before they ever get on the phone with me. From the Demo Stack Studios in Scottsdale, Arizona, this is Go to Market This Week. Welcome to episode three of Go to Market This Week. Co hosting today, she, we pulled the emergency lever. Is it lever or lever, Paige? Lever, lever. Okay, maybe it's a Canadian thing. We pulled the emergency lever. Paige is pinch hitting as a co-host. We had a co-host scheduled today, but uh, apparently there's kids are getting sick. It's that time of year, Paige. So we're going to focus on go to market this week. We're going to be talking about that. We've got a lot of amazing, great guests. So Paige, thanks for thanks for filling in. You are welcome. Didn't have much of a choice, but. I'm happy to be here. By the way, Paige is the producer of the show, show. So if Paige emails you and says, hey, you want to come on the show? Or can we book you flights to come in? Or are you coming through Phoenix? You should call Nick. It's going to be coming from Paige, not from me. If you get an email from me, it's just, just disregard it. But Paige, you want to listen to. She's the heavy. How can you say no to this space now that you've seen it? Now, now you know. You can't say no to me. So Paige, we're going to start talking go to market. But first, we got something really cool happening this week. And it's go to market this week. We're throwing a party in Toronto. Toronto, no tea. So I love that we've been teaching you kind of these uh, Canadianisms to get you prepared for this party. So Lavender and Demo Stack are throwing a party on Thursday, October 27th. It's at the Amsterdam Brew Hall in Lee Side, not the one downtown. We did it on Lee Side. It's along the DVP for my Torontonians. So come out, hang out with us. Uh, there's going to be Lavender, Demo Stack. We might have some appearances by some of the JB sales team. Looking at you, James Buckley. So everyone's got their passports ready. But Paige, I think real quick, we need to discuss something very important about Canadians. If a Canadian says sorry, that's passive aggressive. A Canadian saying sorry one time is not sorry. If a Canadian's really sorry, They'll say, sorry, sorry, sorry. And if they're really sorry, it's sorry, 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 buddy, buddy, I'm so sorry. So you just want to file that away. Okay. So it'll be good to know when anyone is saying they couldn't show up last minute or they're trying to get out of something. Like we can really gauge what they mean by how many sorries they're saying or. Exactly. And if you want to fit in in Toronto, it's not Toronto. That's how we'll peg you as an American right away. Toronto. That last C is silent. It's Toronto. Toronto. Oh, that was good. That was really good. So definitely come hang out with us at that party. It's going to be a lot of friends. Oh, by the way, guest DJ, Saad Khan. He is not just a director of SDRs, of sales development. He's also apparently a DJ. So we're super excited. Saad's going to be DJing again at the Amsterdam Brew House, 45 Eastander in uh, Leaside. Uh, link, of course, is in the comments. Definitely come hang out with us. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, you will not want to miss that. That sounds awesome. Also, I got to look at what food you guys are going to be having. A lot of Canadian things, so like poutines and beaver tails. Very, We're making it very Canadian for the Canadian audience. And it's poutine. It's not poutine. That's that's when an Anglophone is saying it. It's poutine, which, by the way, poutine actually means goddamn mess in slang Quebecois. So there you go. Look at you. Get, like you're just, it's like an overload of Canadiana right now. This is such a learning episode. I feel like people are just getting the inside scoop of like how to just land in Toronto and know, hit the streets. They're ready to go. Absolutely. Hitting the streets in Toronto. It's going to be a lot of fun. And it's end of October. So leaves should be changing, but fingers crossed on no snowstorms. You know, I grew up with snowstorms in June, which is why I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. That's quite a transition. I think from one spectrum to the other, right? <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to be talking about go-to-market strategy and how the go-to-market team kind of prepares for that um, and works in unison. And I think that's something that comes up a lot is how do we actually take our product or our service to market? Any tips and tricks that you're always thinking about when you're thinking of a cohesive go-to-market strategy? I really want to get on the same page with everybody on the team because I think we have to think about the through line of the entire buyer experience, even into when it becomes the customer journey. 
So thinking every step of, you know, from marketing, when they're going to be seeing it first, and then, you know, how they go through the sales funnel, how CS picks up on that, and how we continue to keep them interested in a customer. Because it's not just about, you know, getting them to be a customer, you want to maintain them as a customer. And I think that's one of the spaces that we often forget about is like customer success and how critical that is because it's easier to save a penny than it is to make a penny. At least that's something my parents instilled in me at a young age. Totally. Yeah. I think a lot, even when I was first hearing go to market strategy, I was like, oh, this is like how we're going to launch the brand. This is how we're going to bring it out there. This is what we're going to be giving out as our solution, but it's so much more than that. It's really, it's a circle, you know, it keeps going around and around and around. And it's all about that first touch from whenever discovery happens until you get to retention. Okay, without further ado, let's start talking. Go to market strategy. Let's see who we got here. Jen Allen, chief evangelist at Challenger. Jen, how you doing today? I'm great. Killing it for a Monday. How you doing? Fantastic. You ever been to Toronto? Never. You should come to this party this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, thanks for waiting till the last minute to invite me. <laughs> story of my life. Story of my life. So Jen, today we're talking go to market. So when you're putting together a go to market strategy, how do you actually identify your target market? I think for me personally, it starts with the problem that we solve, right? One of the dangers I think that many of us can run into, I've certainly run into it in the past, is we tell ourselves the story that our product, our solution is for anybody, right? Like I sell sales training. Anybody can benefit from sales training. That's a really dangerous mindset to have because then we go into these conversations with this belief system that we have to sell the benefit of what we're selling. So job number one for me is to say, what is the problem that we are ultimately solving for and what evidence can we find that certain segments of the marketing face that problem and face it to a degree that it's actually so problematic they would do something about it. So that's the simple way that I think about it. How do you do that? Yeah, so there's a, a phrase that I learned um, from Challenger. It's called reframe potential. So reframe potential is basically acknowledging that every buyer out there has a belief or an assumption about how they get the job done today for the product that you sell, right? So again, I sell sales training, just use an example. There's plenty of companies that have their own sales training or have no sales training or they work with somebody else. Like there is an assumption, there is a belief there that what I'm doing is good enough. Now, the mistake I made earlier in my career was assuming that everybody would want to be the best at everything, right? So why wouldn't you want the best sales training out there? There's a lot of reasons for that. It might be more expensive. It might be super disruptive. You might be concerned around whether or not you can implement it. Those are all compelling reasons to do nothing. Um, if I reflect on like the pandemic and looking at Zoom as a potential prospect, they would have been a great prospect in the old definition, right? Because you got a lot of sellers, it's a big sexy logo, wouldn't that feel good to like acquire them, right? But at the end of the day, they were selling more than they could get their, like, their, their arms around. They don't truly need probably at that time a sales training solution to help them build demand. They probably needed a solution to help them convert it faster. And so I think when you approach it that way and you look at your customer segments and say, is it a high, medium, or low pain to solve? That allows us to look at it from the eyes of a buyer instead of the eyes of an opportunistic seller. Like how do you map the buyer journey? Yeah, so one of the other mistakes I made was I would look at the buyer journey starting from the assumption of like, hey, customer is ready to buy my thing, right? Versus looking at what are the steps that precede that. So in, in my case, again, we'll just keep playing out this example. Um, I could start a buyer journey with saying, hey, we have a recognized need that we need to train our salespeople and then look forward from that. What are all the steps people go through? What I will miss are all the people way earlier on where I have an, an opportunity to probably influence them more. So what I'm looking for now is to take it a few steps back to say what precedes someone to say, hey, I acknowledge that maybe I have a sales training problem. It's things like missing my forecast, launching new products, not selling enough of them miss, you know, upsell, cross-sell goals. So how do I reflect on that moment and say, my buyer gets to the point at which they recognize they need sales training because of these things that happened before it. So I'm looking at those earlier steps to say, if I'm a head of sales and that is my target buyer, what are the things that are going to make me feel like I may have a talent problem? And then I'm looking more holistically to say, now I've got to think about which of these levers do I pull? Like I could fire people, hire more people. I could, you know, buy sales tech. There's all sorts of competing things within which sales training is one lever they could pull. So I think taking that step back to say, what is the thing that precedes 
someone saying, I have the problem that we sell and solve, and then looking at from that point forward, now what are all the things that buyer is going to do to get educated about it? So not just like, you know, looking at supplier websites, but where are they going to for information? Who are they consulting for information? What's associations, communities, like groups are they a part of? And trying to, again, think of it like a buyer. If I was a head of sales and I'm thinking about making this massive, you know, investment, I'm sure as hell not going to do it just based off of my gut. I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to understand what others have done before me. I'm going to search online. And so making sure I map that buyer journey to say, what are all those considerations that a, a buyer would typically go through before they ever get on the phone with me? Yeah. Do you see, I mean, this is kind of a tangent, but do you see intent data platforms or things like that? Those really lend a lot of information into finding out what the buyer journey is about or um, you know how you might reframe your go-to-market strategy so I love this question I'm probably gonna make some people unhappy with this answer but I'm gonna be honest I am NOT a huge fan of intent based triggers and here's why when somebody pops for like for me personally on sales training they have already gone through that initial thought process that I was describing, right? And they're probably already at a point where they're forming an opinion around what they think they need, how much they think they need of it, how much they should pay for it, who they should work with. So at that point, if I'm intersecting with that buyer, now I am trying to convince them that there's something that they've missed. That's typically a tough battle for us as sellers to win. Like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Executive, you're wrong. Listen to me. I'm a complete stranger to you, but trust me, you've missed something. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just a weird dynamic. What I'm looking for are the people who have not yet put sales training into the, you know, into a Google search, who are sitting there thinking about terms like, you know, misforecast or things like that. So some of it probably also is like the terminology you are using. But what I often find is many people are looking for like the trigger or the intent signal that they're ready to buy the thing that you sell. And all that's getting us is the 3% of the market that's, that's ready to buy something. It's not really doing much to increase the size of the pie of people that are looking to solve the problem that we solve for. Can you develop uh, personas in advance? Or do you think that you need to live by like proper, properly assessing them? Yeah, that's a great question. I, am, I think it's probably a little bit of both, right? Like personas, I think are great because we need to help sellers understand who is the person that's gonna light you up when you see them, right? So for me, I love a new head of sales that's working for a new CEO. Like that is a persona that I'm like, we can make some, some fair assumptions around what they're spending their time doing, why they were brought in, what they need to solve for it. That's great to know. But I still, as a seller, need to look at that individual account and understand what is the circumstance? What is the problem that they're trying to solve? What is the goal that they're trying to solve? And then reflect on that and say, now what makes it unique for this particular new head of sales, for this particular new head of, of or like a new CEO? So I think honestly, it's, it's candidly, it's a do both strategy, recognizing that if you sell more on the enterprise side, you probably have to do a little bit more work there. If you sell more on the transactional side, maybe you can kind of get more away with just uh, you know, a persona with a little bit less on the other side. Thanks, Jen. I'll ping you. I, I'm awesome. sure it was awesome because like <laughs> Kate was really interested. I heard nothing. So I'm okay. kicking you out of the studio, but I appreciate All you right. so much. Thank you. Bye. All right. Now a very special guest, my boss, Kristen Kulpinski, the director of marketing at DemoStack. Hey, thanks for uh, joining us today. I, I'm glad you accepted the invite. <laughs> it was the least I could do. <laughs> Perfect. So we're talking go to market strategy, Kristen. So let's start with a really high level view of that. You know, what is go to market really? Well, I think in its simplest form, go to market is how you connect your product to customers. So who's your target market? Um, what is the message that's going to resonate with them? How do you position your product? Um, what does your sales motion look like? And what's the pricing model? Like those kind of pieces are the basics that actually build a go to market motion. Who do you think owns the go-to-market strategy? I think go-to-market strategy is always a collaboration between sales and marketing. Um, I do think product marketing is kind of at the center of it because they kind of serve as the glue between all these departments that have a piece of the puzzle. Um, but yeah, I think they're kind of the ones that um, connect the dots between different departments and actually like pass messaging or build messaging, get it in front of your sales team um, and kind of get that out into the market through your marketing team as well. So um, I do think it's a collaboration and I think product marketing is kind of the in-between piece um, that's the main owner. Do you think product marketing as a role, cause I feel like it's a newer role that's become so important. 
But do you think that it became that important because they needed someone to be the glue between all of these other different uh, different areas? I think it became a thing because we realized that there's actually like a specific skill set for serving this need that is cross-functional, that does understand different layers of um, what this motion looks like. And if you just have marketing thinking about it, they're going to think about very top of funnel things or creative ideas for the market and whatnot. And if you just have sales, they're going to think about um, how do we close deals? How do we just get in front of people? And how do we, um, you know, make money on this? And so there's like, there's the in-between pieces of that um, that I think got defined as a skill set that became called product marketing. Obviously, from a company-wide perspective, cohesion is, is critical to a go-to-market strategy. But what if you don't have that out of the gate? How do you, A, assess if you have the cohesion and then, B, actually move forward with it? Um, I think assessing is like, do you have alignment between your various departments? So we've talked about sales, we've talked about marketing, but there's also the product aspect. Um, is your product team aligned with how you plan on bringing this to market? Um, because I think a lot of that has to do with how your product is built. And is it built for the motion that you are, you know, delivering to the market? Um, so I think it's, it's like alignment on strategy and then a lot of, um, like, syncs between departments to make sure that you're all on the same page as you actually bring something into the market. Okay, how would you say developing a go-to-market strategy has changed given the current economic status? So like four months ago, Kristen, how would you approach it versus today? Well, I think high level, you know, a few months ago, everything was about growth at all costs. Um, and given how the market has changed, it's about efficient growth now, sustainable growth. So um, you're not doing whatever it takes to grow the highest amount, you know, month over month. It's about like, how do we do more with less? Um, so that might mean, you know, changes to how you position something um, or changes to um, packaging, changes to like marketing campaigns that you're running. Is it more about organic growth? Is it more about um, just getting as many eyeballs as something on something as before? Where I think as before this market changed, it was like whatever it takes to get in front of every like the largest possible audience and get this in front of as many customers as we can and now it's just like all about doing more with less so we keep hearing a lot about product-led growth it's very buzzy how do you actually assess if your product is actually geared for product-led growth or not like honestly assess that yeah yeah it's a good question i think um you have to ask yourself is your product simple enough to be used and for a customer to see value from it without having anyone holding their hand. Like, can they start using it? No guidance, no like talk track and know what to do enough to see some value and want more. Cause all they need is a little bit. Uh, it doesn't have to be your entire product is given away just like whoever wants to get their hands on it. Um, it's just about like the tiniest bit that will spark a need for more. Kristen, appreciate you so much. Where can we find you? Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place, but yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Rob Napoli, a.k.a. Rise Up Rob, host of the Bear Necessities podcast. How you doing, Rob? Thanks for joining us today. I'm doing well. Hopefully, uh, you all are doing well. It's been far too long since we last got out, so I'm uh, excited to be here, honored to be a part of this, and love what you all have been doing. Listen, we're just happy to have you, man, live from some cafe in Brooklyn, so I'm, I'm all about uh, not that. Actually, not, not a cafe, actually. Um, I'm at a little uh, bar. Uh, it's, you know, it's 3.15. Uh, it was the only place that I could find a halfway decent quiet spot uh, in the city today. So uh, I'm actually going to be uh, seeing Beck Holland and Larry Long Jr. and the crew from Flip the Script tonight because they're here live in New York. Amazing. Say hi to them for me. Say hi to them for me. I, I will. I will. I think this should be good with a beer in hand. I mean, maybe next time we should all have beers, you know, just to like <laughs> get the conversation really flowing. You know, sometimes with my podcast, I, I encourage my guests to have a glass of whiskey or a beer, a glass of wine, especially if it's like first time podcasters or sometimes I get founders that are doing it in their non-native language. I'm like, hey, pro tip, have at least one drink, if not two, before you come on. Just makes you not think so much about um, 
the, the, the way you sound and you become more real, raw, authentic, and vulnerable, which is what podcasting is all about. I like to call that a personality drink. I think with networking, <laughs> anything like that, having a nice personality drink, uh, you know, really helps you be yourself. We're talking go-to-market strategy today. How do you put together, you know, the, the nuance of it? So how do you actually classify your value proposition and, and make sure that you actually have it right? That is the million dollar question, right? And I love talking to people about this because when I ask for people's value props, so many times I get a paragraph. A value prop should be simply one sentence on what you do better than anybody else. Right, and if you can get it down into one sentence, that just makes it clear. Because the idea of a value prop is to one, give value, and to me, to incite further for the conversation, incite the interest. Right, it should be that pop that gives you that exciting interest. That's like, oh, I want to learn more about this shit. What are your tips to keeping that message clear? Write down everything you want to say. Like when you think about the value you give, write down everything you want to say, and then workshop that. And I always tell people, like, you need to go outside your organization to get real objective feedback. And I also don't look for validation, right? I say, look for objection. Look for people to ask questions because once they start asking questions and dig into it, then you start seeing what works and what doesn't and you work on refining that. And then it comes down to, you need to pitch it a hundred and hundred times. Do it in the mirror, do it on video, practice, practice, practice until you get it down to one sentence. But it starts by writing everything down because what you'll realize is you're writing down a lot of features and benefits and not actual like true value. And so once you get that out of your system, then you can get at the heart of what really value means and what the value your company, your product, your service does um, to the market. Yeah, I saw a funny thing once that was like try to explain it to your parents or yeah, you know, as a millennial, of course, we all work at tech companies or whatever. And, you know, it's like, oh, go back and try to, to explain it to your parents what you do. Um, I personally had a had a difficult time doing that since they have no idea what SaaS software is. Um, so I think if you can condense it down and like get your parents to understand it, um, you know, talking to people that have no idea what things are. That's probably a great way to hone your message too. I'll give you one step further. And I challenge my founders, especially founders that have um, kids, is can you explain what you do to your kid? And can they understand it? They don't have to know everything like SaaS, things like that, but can they understand the value that you look to create? And if you can do it at that core level, and kids are smarter than we think, right? We don't give them enough credit, but if we can do that at the core level, then you start really understanding what value means. Because to understand the value prop, you need to get out of the bullshit of like the buzzwords and the jargon that we have in today's business, like SaaS, cool, software as a service is a buzzword, but everything's SaaS these days and it's all derivative. So what really makes you stand out? What is the thing in your product, service, technology that is exciting, that really gives value? And what does that value look like? That's fantastic. Okay, so you figured all this out, you feel good about the messaging, Next question is, how do you price it? And then the follow-up is, how do you know if you actually nailed the pricing? Pricing is, is hard, right? And a lot of times when you really kind of get started, you always like want to price a little bit less than the market is a competitive advantage. And what I tell people is that in your value prop, time and money should not be the key thing. There are certain example exceptions to the rule on that, right? Um, but every value should not just be time and money. We know that by nature, software as a service does that. So I throw that out. What I first say is, and I always recommend this to people, there's a book by Austin Hansen called Steal Like an Artist, right? And the basic concept is go to the market, look at what your competitors are doing, see what they're doing well, see what their pricing is, see what their value is. Then you can base it off that and then take it to a small subset, test it out. If people are buying really quickly or really interest really fast, maybe they're seeing great value for the dollar and it might be a little less. If they're like, oh, that's really expensive, then you know that your price is too high. But you got to, I mean, and, and you should understand what your market value rate is, right? You should understand at least what your competitors are doing, what the market's looking to buy, and then test that out. And then you just make small adjustments and kind of leverage it from there and you just test it. But you, don't take it to, to a big market, test in small segments. What if you've gone really high and you have a couple buyers, but then realize the market needs to be lower, you lower it, but now you've got people bought in at the higher price. What do you, what do, you do in that situation? Well, it depends on the nature of the business. And if you're gonna put that uh, pricing on online, right? It's like if you have it as a pricing on your website, which is not because it's more of a services based. 
and then be honest. I mean, if you, these are great customers and they bought in, like you can keep them at a higher price as long as they just need back, but the world's small. We just say, hey, we, uh, we might have overcharged and we're really excited. We're going to give you X, Y, or Z, whether that's a, a free month, a discount, something to keep them bought in to show them service. But at the end of the day, if you're providing an exceptional value and exceptional service, people are going to pay for that. And they feel like it's, it's fair. It's for the same example that you might have two people in a similar job getting different salaries. They feel like they're they're earning what they what they owe or they deserve because the the work they're putting out and the value that they're giving two ways. And so I, it really is just kind of like how you want to do that. But I'm always saying be transparent on your pricing with your customers and don't be afraid to have those conversations with them. It's gonna show that you believe in them and they believe in you. Rob, what are you deadlifting these days? <laughs> uh, I haven't gone heavy in a while. The last um kind of heavy ish day that I did, I did three sets of five at five fifteen. Oh my gosh. See, I had Mike Simmons in last week, you this week. I can't, I can't, I don't even want to go to the gym hanging out with you guys. Rise up, Rob, Rob Napoli. Where, where can we find you, Rob? Yeah, uh, make it really simple. My website, robnapoli.com, uh, has links to all my social platforms. Uh, it's a one step shop. Also, has my book and my podcast. You can find everything, robnapoli.com. Make it real easy for y'all. Also, at Brooklyn Beer Gardens, <laughs> apparently, is where you can find them. So, just in case, if you weren't sure, <laughs> That looks like a lager, though, Rob. Doesn't look like an IPA. Around 3 p.m. Uh, every day. <laughs> Nick, you nailed it on the head. <laughs> all right. Rob, appreciate you so much. Grateful to all our guests today for coming in and talking go-to-market strategy. Paige, what are the, some of the key takeaways that you learned today about putting together a go-to-market strategy? Well, I think, you know, from top to bottom, just thinking about your target audience, who you want to go after, crafting that message so that it's very targeted to who your right buyer is, but almost like you need to back up and get perspective to make it simple to where it's understood by the masses. And then I think, you know, just learning how a team works together to put together this go-to-market strategy and how product marketing is really the glue that connects all of the other different departments together to not only create, but I think really start to evolve the messaging over time. I love it. Follow us on LinkedIn at DemoStack and of course across all the social platforms for not just the Go to Market This Week show, but you know, we're dropping lots of content here at the DemoStack Studios in Phoenix. Also, if you come to Phoenix, let me know. I'll pick you up at the airport. Thanks, Paige. Thank you.